Welcome to Real Flicks Reviews. We're like a book club for people who hate reading. This month they're doing grab bags, so James picked Night of the Living Dead, 1990. We bring you movie news. This week we have Jonathan Charney, James Stevens, and Hello. Ryan Preston. So the description of Night of the Living Dead, 1990... He's going to like this one. <laughs> it's another IMDb classic, which I actually think describes the entire plot of, well, you'll see. The, un the unburied dead return to life and seek human victims. <laughs> By the way, this is the plot of this movie and the entire Resident Evil franchise. And, the and, dead. and, and the entire zombie franchise, almost, essentially. <laughs> Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, I just love how simple this is. And this is a remake of, if you guys don't know who George A. Romero is, you need to just shut the hell up. Pretty simple. Um, We're the only ones talking, bro. I know. But there's always people commenting. Uh, you know, I gotta say, you know, this the one is way better than, you know, Mein Kampf, I mean, Das Boot. Wow, so you're, you're really kicking it off right there. <laughs> <laughs> he actually wrote that in his notes, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my I god. Totally he's, just, he's just digging his heels into the commenters, folks. <laughs> he is. You know, he's, the thing I gotta say about this one is, I saw this right when it came out on VHS. So, you know, I was literally like nine when I saw this. And this movie as a nine-year-old was creepy as hell and awesome and just <laughs> wonderful. I loved it. I could see back back in the 90s, this had a, I think that the film and all the way that it was, it looked even creepier. Because this yeah. had kind of, in my opinion, maybe it was the film that looked low grade. It was, it wasn't the best lighting. So in the 90s, this movie would have really freaked you well, out if you were a kid. Well, in 1968, when George A. Romero put this together the first time, this was black and white, low budget. It was like he literally threw this together. And, I mean, literally, there was so like I, very little screenplay. It was just this. So I actually haven't seen the 60s version, but from what I've read and from what I gathered is this Don't is... Don't bother. This is the exact same thing. I was going to say, from, from what it seems, from what I've heard, this is the movie he originally wanted to make, including, like, say, the ending lynching scene. Yeah. <laughs> which they couldn't do because of the racial tensions of the 60s. Yeah. Um, there's, honestly, there's almost no plot to this movie, if you could call it. No plot. My favorite character is kind of the, the, the alcoholic guy whose daughter's in the basement. <laughs> really? Well, the, 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 the reason... Oh, uh, Tom Tells? Yeah, the reason why I liked him is because you automatically knew that he was going to be the reason why all of them but one ended up dead. Yeah, I mean, like for the first time I saw him, like, oh, it's him, dude. He's I like the, butler. the fact that he didn't lift anything except for a TV, and he dropped it. And I mean, that TV had to weigh a lot. <laughs> yes, I mean, they didn't make lightweight TVs back then. Oh no, no, my yeah, <laughs> my parents had a 32 inch TV in the 80s that weighed 450 pounds. It yeah. took three people and a mule for Sister Sarah to move it. Uh, I mean. I gotta say, for for a horror film, this one is like as simplistic as you can get. And I think this this horror movie, they're letting the atmosphere of it be a more the, pretty much to ramp up the the scary factor in it. Because like the zombies, I mean, like the Walking Dead zombies, if they have like the Walking Dead zombies and the atmosphere, I think this movie would be perfect. Well, I mean, this is really where they came up with. A lot of the the zombie lore as how things are going to work in a zombie outbreak, and I love the fact that the rednecks won in this film. Oh yeah, I mean that was one of the greatest things that and, I always thought was great is and all the, the gun toting nuts are the ones that survive the night. Unless you're a trauma <laughs> fan. Um, yeah, no, I I'm trying to think this this movie's like full of great little nuggets of scenes, you know, like. Like the same thing with a character with Tom Towles' character, Harry Cooper, and his daughter's sick that got bit. Yeah. And I think that the problem that we have watching this after the fact is in the 90s and in the 60s, all that was new. So you couldn't really, it's like, you couldn't predict it. This movie's very predictable, almost the level of vampire movie, because you, you know all the lore. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, at the time, like John's saying, it was like, like seeing it as a nine-year-old being introduced to zombies this way it was amazing now the the 68 version i i'm assuming it became a cult classic was that hard to 
fine in the, the 90s. I don't remember oh, it at all. dude, it was like you didn't even know it existed until somebody's like, oh, yeah, have you heard George A. Romero? And you're like, who? So this that, so this is pretty much a, like a racer head, like rare. Back yeah, in back in the day. Okay, so so pretty much this was like the reboot of the franchise. Yeah, the, this is Tom Savini doing an homage to, to okay. Romero. I mean, uh, if you guys don't know who Tom Savini is, he is like the godfather of every special effect that you can think of in movies from the 80s, 90s, up and up until recently as well. I mean, I think he's still doing uh, stuff in the 2015, right, Ryan? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, him and Greg Nicotero uh, are, are pretty much the, the, the go-to guys, the kind of guys that are doing Walking Dead today. Yeah. Um, they, they started out doing George Romero stuff uh, in, in the 60s. You know, like like his special effects guys, you know, sort of under the tutelage of, of George Romero. To me, this movie was Greg, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Tom Savini trying to, to, to make a name for himself as a director, not just the special effects guy. And he, he basically just took every single page out of George Romero's book um, and, and, and redid it, yeah. essentially. Now, um, and I'm a f- there was nothing really added new to the story. Um, now, you- and in the 90s, I think people were used to a, to a different pace. Um, yeah. Obviously, this is early 90s, but we, we, we definitely got out of the late 60s, you know, where you where you can justify that that freaking six minute opening scene with the dumbass brother making fun of her. Dude, um, that was a, I, but I, I liked how fast it turned into the yes. zombie outbreak. Yeah. Um, and this movie is still yeah, it like- turned into it fast and then didn't do anything for like 45 minutes. I mean, this this could have been called the story of getting to the truck. Yeah, <laughs> and then blow the truck up. It's like it's like the song. Right, that never exactly. Ends. I mean, the only satisfying scene, seriously, was the end scene when, like you said, the rednecks ruled the day. And, exactly and she it. shot that guy in the but, face. I would actually say the pacing on this movie to me was one of the redeeming points of this movie because, like, a lot of horror movies today, they're either like too slow or they they use the very fast pace to make it scary. Then they go on the next you know thing and then the next thing. I think that was one of the redeeming factors because it was steady. It wasn't slow. It wasn't fast. It just was. Yeah, I mean, the, I liked that. The one thing, that, the only things that really bothered me in this one was the screaming girl. That that yes. got old. Uh, that one. got old. You mean Daisy? This Duke? round, yeah, whatever her name was. Um, and then the fact that Tallman character uh, Barbara never put the butt of the gun on her shoulder. Well, that was. I, that yep. could be why she wasn't hitting headshots every time. <laughs> I didn't get a. I, on a, I should have. Wish I paid a little bit more attention. I didn't really know if that was like a the full on rifle cartridge or a pistol cartridge. Because if it was like a forty five, you know, long. I don't bolt, think it was a forty five. I think it was twenty two or a little bit bigger. I don't think it was a forty five long. Um, yeah, I and I thought it was funny how she went from like Laura Ingalls to like the female Rambo Dude, she within a couple of minutes. Fast. <laughs> it was like. I'm going to get undressed. Now I'm badass. It was like... Yeah, she put some pants on. Which is better huh. than the chick in the last uh, Jurassic Park world thing. Who she just tied her shirt in a knot and kept her high heels on. Yeah. But yeah, so, but so to me, I mean, the, this this thing was full of, of, of little things like that. That at the time, we, we already had Night of the Living Dead, the first one. We already had Dawn of the Dead, which is... An incredibly great movie. I, yeah. I mean, the, the plot of Dawn of the Dead, I, I mean, is what people should be aiming for with, with zombie flicks. Um, but, but this one, it, I mean, it really just kept to this, like, ultra-simple, limited story that, that didn't didn't really go anywhere. And if you're going to have that slow of pacing, you got to have something other than Screaming Girl, you know? No, I, yeah. I haven't seen Dawn of the Dead, just to, to, oh, be, okay. to, to be out in the open. Um, what... What's the difference between, you know, this one being a copy of George A. Romero's and, and this? Was- okay, well, the, the, the main difference, and you can extrapolate from here, this one uh, uh, takes place in a house. Uh, Dawn of the Dead takes place in a shopping mall. Yeah. Oh, so that's, okay, right never, there, that's that one. Right in the yeah, episode. Right there you already have, like, an, uh, like an endless supply of, of, of fodder for, for good writing, where this one you have the most, like, obvious old-school Hollywood characters. Uh, I mean, the characters reeked of, of the 1960s. Yeah. Because it was just really simple 
face uh, uh, characters. You got the, the the dumb redneck guy, the the hard headed uh, 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 asshole, the submissive wife. Um, I mean, every, every plot turn you know is, is coming a mile away. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the characters got, are so simple. And then you got Tony Todd, totally hand to hand zombie fighter. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but everybody can be a hand-to-hand zombie uh, fighter when they're moving that slow. Remember when you used to fight with your buddies when you're, like, 10 years old and everything was, like, choreographed so you, you looked really cool doing it? What? Well, you know, uh, never mind. <laughs> wait, wait, you had choreographed fights when you were a little kid? Yeah, right. How cute. Wow. <laughs> City people. <laughs> <laughs> he does live in the land of Hollywood. Um, <laughs> um, I see. I, Ryan's totally right. There, there's, 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 it's there's, simple. This movie's about as deep as a, you know the kiddie pool, far as plot wise. Oh yeah, I mean th- that's the that's the thing that I enjoyed about this one, and that's why I wanted to. We really haven't. If we look at our show, we really have not stepped into the horror genre at all. Not really. I think this is really our big breakthrough movie into it. I I would say that was Exorcist. Yeah, but even still, that's not on the same uh, horror table as this. I, I mean, I well, mean, you got some great characters in it. You got, uh, like I mentioned, Tony Todd. Tony Todd really didn't have much of a role in this film. He is a fantastic actor. I love him in Candyman. I was going to say, you should have picked Candyman. I mean, well, I, I like this one because this one's hopefully it's better than hard, Hopefully it's better than me. Hard Candy. Uh, um. We are going to have to pick some Candyman for John. Oh, um, th- thanks. But, I mean, he's just a. I I enjoyed him. Like I saw him in this, and I'm like, oh man, I forgot he was in here. But it's you know, nice. he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, I mean, he plays a fantastic bad guy, like fantastic. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah. I'm I, still I, scared to death of bees. Yeah, <laughs> but um, and then you got uh Tom Towles, who I've seen him in a bunch of other stuff. He's uh um, uh, in some of the Halloweens as well. He's not a really great actor. He's usually kind of a stitch actor where he plays that bad guy, the guy that you love to hate and you want to see die. He reminds me of Archie Bunker, honestly. <laughs> From you all wanted of to yeah. see Archie yeah. Bunker die. Yeah, maybe. Well, he, Carol O'Connor's already dead, so yes. Yeah, well, I uh, like but I mean, Carol he kind of reminds me of that, of that, that, um, that personality type, the character he plays. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. But um, you know, I mean, because he's, he's so, oh, but he has sixty-one uh, movies to his credit and TV shows. Yeah, I was gonna say roles. Let's say roles. Yeah, not, so I mean, that's that, that's but, that's actually not bad. I mean, yeah. honestly. But I mean. As Ryan said, you didn't really need a lot of character actors. I mean, there was a couple times with Patricia Tallman that I'm just kind of like, you're overplaying it, what I was looking at her. But, you know, that's hindsight and actually kind of be critiquing of the film and that. But that's like wait, nitpicking wait, wait, because we, this... We, we do do a movie show. I know, and but we I'm, do I'm, pick things apart. I mean, it's kind of the show. But I'm saying there's not enough, as Ryan's saying, plot devices to really do much with this oh no but i mean as far as i'm concerned this one is a very simple break into horror film is really why i think of it but like i said for me this one's nostalgia it's one of the first ones i remember seeing as a horror film i the the thing that really struck me is in 1990 this was r-rated this would get a pg in today's society yeah. So that that's the thing that struck me as I'm watching this going this is R? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen kids cartoons that are more violent than this movie. <laughs> and I wish I was kidding. Yeah. Um the other thing the, the other thing that notices is the language in this movie, I don't remember a whole lot of cussing. No. Really Which is wasn't. one of the thing that struck me is it's a horror movie and in horror movies at least the ones I've seen in the last decade, there's always cussing you know like it enhances the scene if that makes sense. i mean like when you got the guy like literally pulling up a shotgun to shoot the lock off of off of a gas off of a gas uh a gas pump and he didn't even say shit like you know it's like you should you should realize you're pointing Anyway, or like, I just thought that was one of my favorite scenes. I love the reaction of the the person. Was it the, no, it was the guy, the black guy who watched it. Yeah, Tony Todd. Tony Todd, and he's just like, 
you see him go like, what? That that dumbfounded look is like was hilarious. Yeah, it's like, huh? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I actually and kind of wish they ended the movie when he found the the the, the gas. Keys. That <laughs> yeah. would have been a perfect natural ending for the movie. Him maniacally laughing. Yeah, I I thought it was kind of a waste of his cigarette though. I mean, he pulls out a broken one, pulls out one, lights it, looks over, it, laughs, and throws it across the room. It's like, um, all right. Well, he knows he's not going to need them. I mean, come on. <laughs> What's he doing? Saving it for the person who finds a zombie corpse? What, the cigarette? The, yeah, it's a box of cigarettes. Well, it was empty. <laughs> Jeez, John, did you watch the movie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you know, but for me, this one's not a high-rating film, though, to be honest. I like it. It's nostalgia, like I said, but honestly, if I have to put it down, I mean, it's like a Two and a half, Ryan. Yeah, and and it's a two and a half, and it gets a full point credit for uh, Tom Savini being as integral as as he is to the zombie genre in general. Yeah, you know? uh, I mean the, the the he gets that credit just for for teaching Greg Nicotero, you know how to how to do special effects makeup. Yeah, I you know I'll so see. I'll give it a three out of five. Just actually, I, I do want to point out two things real quick, though. the The opening scene after the long ass credits, um, <laughs> when they're they're at the the cemetery and the guy starts walking up in the suit. Oh yeah. The, the, the two details. Um, one they got wrong. One they got totally right, and they they must know a mortician. <laughs> one you would never have an open casket at a cemetery. Um, two. The clothes cut up the back like that is exactly how they do it. <laughs> it's a lot e- easier to dress a, a, a deceased person when you cut the clothes. By the by, yeah. by the way, Ryan, have I ever told you you have some odd hobbies? Um, I. <laughs> but there's no stick up his butt. I, how do you keep no, it straight? That's, that's, no. <laughs> how do you make his hand talk? You know. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I give it a three out of five. I mean, this is kind of exactly what I thought of, thought it was going to be. Uh-huh. Um, you know, typical. I don't. I don't know. I mean, there's there's not a lot you can say to it because the movie kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. There's not a lot I in mean, this movie, honestly. Really, not that we. Not a lot we can talk about on I this mean, one. I mean, the fact Ryan got the, the 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 point out of the of the points he just talked about to me is probably the most you can really get out of this movie was nitpicking that. <laughs> Um, so no, it, to me it's a strong three out of five. Um, strong? We're gonna have to really yeah. delve into yeah. some horror film right. now. I, I, I don't know <laughs> if I don't just I don't know. I just it was it was it was decent. I don't know if I'd find it entertaining, but it wasn't bad. So three out of five. Know, the one thing I will say about this one is that it's an hour and a half long, and it's the f- pacing didn't seem like it took that long. It's a fast hour and a half. I mean, it's yeah. not Schindler's List hour. You know, three hours or two and a half hours. Hour and a half. Dude. Well, you know what I mean. Not three hours. Well, I mean, there's some movies like Schindler's List, you know, like, they <laughs> seemed like they, they're good movies, but they have a slow pacing. You were so easy to do that, too. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. So, I, this is strong three out of five, I guess. Uh, I'm going to switch switch to Outsiders, um, uh, the, the TV series. Now, this is Out, my outside, pick. Yeah. Ryan has failed to watch it again. So, I guess it's John and I on this one. He has um, hobbies, man. This one... This show is strange. I like, I saw, uh, where I watched it, there was a little bit of an inter- interview at the end of the clip. It was like Mad Max yeah, combined it, with something else. And the first... Mad Max, guys? Come on, really? Just because you have little quads that you do little no, dances with? The first, just watching the first, the pilot of this movie and the way they did it, it, it... The, uh, it, the pilot really gave him kind of a hint of having some sort of mystical mysticism power to it. Yeah. Um, which they didn't show, and I, I thought the a little bit of a spoiler alert, but if you're watching the show, well, we're going to spoil it anyways. Um, the point where he killed that old lady, and she kept threatening stuff. Yeah. That was the one scene I was thinking, that would have been a great way to hint at something even if it was like a burn mark a scar they, they doing something did with the way that the weather started acting weird outside but with that the was wind they, and shit but it wasn't was that weird. with when they stapled the eviction notice versus when when the 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 elder was killed what do you mean when he put his hand over her face and attacked her 
Yeah, like that when she was killed, I don't remember anything happening. Yeah, there's there was like some type of stuff going on outside. He stops and kind of like looks around oh. type thing. It was we were really strange, oh, but the, the other, they didn't really get into it. So say the one, the scene I thought was funny, if you can, well, if you consider murder funny, was drinking <laughs> that white lightning and that kid going berserk. Yeah. I was like, damn, that was some strong shit. Uh, well, they said they cut it with some type of like snake poison or something is kind of what they're trying to hint at. But I mean, even that, it was like you're you're watching the kid drink it, and you're like, dude, if you finish that whole thing, you're gonna like have alcohol poisoning. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. he would have not have made it home if he had finished that entire jug yeah. by himself. And he would have died. And it wasn't like the rest of them up on the hill who, you know, had built him tolerance to it. Yeah. It was that whole scene right there where he supposedly drank the entire jug of their best stuff. It was like, dude, like if you do that with just 80 proof vodka, you're going to die. I, I do. I do got to say, I love the atmosphere. This, the show gives, uh, I love both sides of the atmosphere. Kind of the cop versus. The yeah. Well, I mean, like for one thing they had up on the hill, they had, you know, it was kind of like, I don't know, 14th century and Mad Max style. And you could tell that everything was right. But when you go back down to the valley, it was kind of, you know, the oppression and the darkness and yeah. that it felt. It was really well done. Um, I From the first episode, I don't really know, I'd say, if this would go anywhere or not. Yeah, I don't see but much it, life in it. It starts out amazing, but I have a feeling, it, like, you, you know, I have a feeling it's going to piddle out yeah I, I don't see a lot of life in the in the show i mean they're gonna have to pull some end game here and if they don't then that's just a bad move which as ryan points out america tv does not know when to stop on the other hand i kind of thought about that of sons of anarchy after one of the seasons i was thinking this is going to end long and it and lasted longer than i thought it would yeah yeah, that's true. So there's but, always there's always room to kind of turn it around and you know use. But other than having Opie in here, I don't really see it much as Sons of Anarchy type thing. Yeah, true. I just you know, as far as how the fact that you know you see the end, the last episode's like okay, this is gonna end next season. It lasts like four seasons longer yeah. than you thought it would. Yeah. Anyway. Um. So just to let you know, we do have a Facebook page. Do you love us, hate us? If you're creative, we'll actually read you in air and most likely ridicule you. Because well, that's what you're doing to us. Turnarounds, fair play, and also, if, <laughs> also, you know, if you want to donate to Old Guy Tech TV, help keep the lights on. So um, I'm going to ask this to Ryan, and then I'm going to throw it out to John as well. So, <clears throat> in your opinion, if you actually think no. a, a comic book to live action film, other than Wolverine or something like that. What is one of the worst comic book or comic series Ooh. that turned live action Ooh, can I go that first? comes to mind? Can I go first? Okay. Howard the Duck. All right. Well, you got that. Um, <laughs> Which, by the way, is a comic book, ladies and gentlemen. But if we think of hardcore comic, more of like kind of Marvel, DC type stuff. The um, 1970s version of, uh, <laughs> of Doctor Strange. Okay. Well, I was, I was going to say, I mean, either the, the Hulk couple of movies they tried to do or the uh, the, the Schumacher Batmans. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I got one. The uh, early 90s Captain America. Okay. I, I, I'm going to throw one else out to you guys to to see what you guys have to say. It had John Leguizamo in it. Oh, Spawn. Oh, yes. So, um, what did you guys actually think of the 1997 live-action version of Spawn? My my biggest problem with it is because there's an HBO cartoon. If you watch the HBO, amazing. If you watch the HBO cartoon, it's Keith David is my man. It's it's how the comic book looks. It's the feel, and then you get like the the movie, and it's like. Uh, over the cool top world. Cartoon. It's like watching Cool World is what it's like. Yeah, I, it's I like Schumacher directed it. it. But I see your I see your point. It's not the comic book. But I will give you this: when I was a kid, I mean, when that movie came out, um, that got me into looking into Spawn. And then when I found the, the the books, it was like, oh shit, this is way better than the movie. I would say the so, redeeming quality of the movie, honestly, was John Leguizamo. Leguizamo for. Crying out loud. Yeah. Uh, he got Whatever. a clown. He did the clown perfect. Yeah, he's also so, one of my favorite comedians. Now, 
this this actually came out today. This is quote unquote from Todd McFarlane. Ooh. I've finished the script and I'm in the process of editing. It's 183 p- pages and producers usually like 120. I still wow. think it's going to end up being 140 because I'm putting in details for myself. It's a director's script. I want it to get I want to get it to a spot where I can walk into Hollywood and start hooking the actors. I think I have the also our version of that story linked on the Facebook page. Now, he has also said that he may not give the reins over to a director. He yeah, may if do Tom this. At, stays attached to this. There's no way this fails. He's saying right now that he is not going to let this go. He will do a directorial debut with this film. Who? 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 I mean, he could crowdfund this thing and do it off of a freaking uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, the special effects, and, and and it would be awesome just because he's attached to it. Does he now? Does he? Does his company release the comic book? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is Todd McFarlane's baby. I, you know, <coughs> my he's first... he actually put together and released all the HBO comic I, specials. I have two. I have a couple of thoughts. One being, if they pick a director and then he stays like in charge, they picked of it. a fantastic well, director no. for the live action. He already had Terminator Two under his well, belt well, and Jurassic Park. I see. I don't know. See, I I still think they're going to need some sort of director or somebody to help them. But if they have somebody who listens to like his vision, then I think it'll be perfect. Yeah, that's. I'm a little worried about him doing him being his directorial debut. Debut, and it's just you know it's like a pat on the back, and it's not a good movie. It's kind of what I'm afraid of. That's kind of what I'm afraid of too. But I think what how bad Spawn was that he's not going to let that happen again is what he's kind of saying. And I've also heard that this movie is, uh, I read a couple of months ago, it might pull what uh, con- the comic book Constantine does. That's going to be continuous. Basically being, was it 14, 20 years since the original released? It's going to be so many years. It's going to be modern day. It's going to continue. It's not going to be a reboot from what I've read. Okay, he could he could pull that off, which I think I mean, would be a better way to do it personally. The the thing that that bothers me though is, um, I mean, Keith David is the voice of Spawn for me. I mean, yeah, for sure. When I think of Spawn's voice, it's Keith David. It's and pretty Keith much Keith David has such the perfect voice for it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like Darth Vader not being James Earl Jones. Right. It it just doesn't fit. So you think they're going to be able to get him? Oh, dude, Keith David's too old. He he is not... I mean, he he could be the spawn after he gets burned. Well, I mean, if, <laughs> you well, know? Well, I mean, yeah, if, he, he can do the Darth Vader and do the voice, you know, the, the Batman voice if he gets into his costume. But yeah, the guy that plays him, they, they got to... He's got to have the voice in and out of the of the mask. Yeah. So I mean, other than that, I I don't see how Keith David could do this. Yeah, that's no, a good he, point. he won't be able to. But I think that uh, I, I mean, honestly, I even if it's his directorial debut, McFarland. Hello. I whatever uh, actors he to to continue whatever vision that he has. I'll, yeah. I'll I'll be completely honest. One of the the other issues I actually had with Spawn is Michael. The, the guy who played Spawn. Michael J. White. Giacomo, yeah, Michael J. White. I actually liked him back in the day when I saw this movie, but I, I watched this a couple of years ago, and he's one of the issues yeah, in he, this movie. He was one of my well, big okay, issues. Let's, let's give credit to the other issue of freaking, uh, uh, um, oh, man, Sheen, Mark, Mark, Mark Sheen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought, I, thought, I thought Michael White, I thought he played a little too over the top. And Martin Sheen was ridiculous in this movie. He should have never been in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Michael Michael J. White definitely went for the comic book side of it, like the uh, the, the the kitschy kind of thing that uh, that, that happened in in the Schumacher Batman. <clears throat> yes, thing. that's it. That's a perfect description of it. But um, but I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's it, not not a whole lot of people. Would have would have played that role to begin with, and and, and fit it with the the skill and, and him being a stunt man already, you know, was was a big part of it. Yeah, but I mean, 
I don't know. I really wanted something to be like the comic book and the cartoon <laughs> when I saw it. I think and it, that just was not spawned, and it's always been one of those like black stains on the Spawn franchise. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah, for any anybody who's judging Spawn based solely on the movie, go go check out one of the books. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think now we have a greater t- chance to have an actual decent live action version of Spawn versus the early '90s, because the, the the late '80s and early '90s gave you. The Batman movies with Joel Schumacher gave you Howard the Duck. And comic books were kids' movies. Now with Marvel and you have the Bat you know, the, the newer the newer Batman movies. I think you now have a chance to actually have something that's one to one the comic versus the comic book. Well, the thing that I want to point out, and I'm actually trying to see it doesn't tell me what this film what spawn was rated back then. I think it was only PG oh, it was R. So they're saying it, it that's was a soft R. R. Yeah, it was a really soft R, and that's the issue. That's the other issue I had with it, because Spawn and, and I'm gonna throw this one out because I haven't seen it yet. John has. I don't think Ryan has seen it either. Deadpool and Spawn were two of the like more hardcore uh, comics that were out there. I mean, Spawn had no issue literally slaughtering somebody. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And the language of Spawn and the Clown. The Clown was a demon, for those of you that don't really know. I mean, it was literally a demon, and it was a filthy freaking demon. That's the <laughs> I reason mean, John Leguizamo did a fantastic job, but he didn't go as dark as that clown really was. I mean, well, that I, clown I was I don't disgusting. think they could have, without in the early 90s, getting that NC-17 no, rating. No, they could have gotten away with it. So with, Even HBO with, would have said no. With how far they pushed Deadpool, do you think they could push the push it to where spawn needs to go to oh, hell yeah. I, I oh hell yeah oh hell yeah because of deadpool it's going to open up a lot of avenues for the for the adult comic thing oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I do I, I do have a few issues since i did actually see it this weekend and i'll get more don't, to don't it. Spoil it i'm gonna go tomorrow yeah. I'm, i'll get more into it um if we review it um but one issue i'm gonna have in this movie is the people who are brought in the theater and i'll tell you more about that if we review it <laughs> um but, oh yeah, I I think because of Spawn and because of Marvel and the DC movies coming up. You mean Deadpool? Well, yeah, I mean the Marvel, <laughs> DC, the Spawn, uh, you know, yeah, Deadpool, and I think all these movies. Spawn has a greater chance to actually be good instead of being Howard the Duck, which was the movie was pretty much. It and I don't like going there, but I want to actually just say I think the one that changed that pushed um, comic book movies live action movies into the rated r genre was hancock honestly Uh, because they pushed the envelope of having a character that is from a comic book into an r-rated type of uh genre that was uh, you know that was the most uncomic booky comic book yeah i was hancock rated r yes yes yeah. Was it really? Yeah, it was rated R for language and uh, oh. situational, like him being a drunk type thing. I, no, totally. I I actually completely agree because I don't know. I'm not even sure if I knew it was an actual comic book. Yeah, it was. It um, was. until you mentioned it, but uh, a while ago when we were talking. So. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I think I mean, because of that and a few other things, I think it'll be perfect. So yeah, that's what my fear was, is because I mean, Spawn. It, I don't like I I hate talking about the 97 Spawn movie. I really do. I mean, I love that. I love the the HBO what they did with it because it really so so brought movement into to it. To get you know, more I mean, into this, I'm one of a, to get more into this, one of us is going to have to take a bullet and pick Spawn so we get to hear him bitch more. Wait. Not the HBO no, I'm talking about the 97. I'm, f- I'm kind of in the mood to watch that. No, I'm now. talking about maybe sometime I'll, I'll <laughs> bite the bullet and, and pick the 97 spawn just so we can have an episode of you kvetching about it. Oh, dude, it was filthy, man. Uh, <laughs> so, that movie was like, you so, had to take a shower after watching it. <laughs> hey, I've met some politicians and felt that way. Ladies and gentlemen, next week is Ryan's pick. So, <laughs> Ryan's pick. So, Ryan, you're up. Okay. Um, everybody's seen Can't Swingers. Be. Okay. And everybody knows that that Vince Vaughn is a is a is a is a funny character. Okay. Um, about 
like less than a third of the people I know that have seen Swingers have seen this movie, and it came out pretty shortly after. And to me, it's 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 funnier for for a lot of different reasons. Um, but Bond, directed by John Favreau, written by the pair of them, uh, made. Um, Brian, you know you're cutting out, right? What what movie did you pick? Nope. Uh, 2001, Made. Made. Okay. Okay. Because that totally cut out <laughs> right when you said that. Okay. I was saying, I, I was, I was thinking that dramatic pause was a little much. Um, so, uh, we picked a TV series for this week. Uh, Brian suggested, what was, what did you say last week? X-Files? Yes. Okay. Right. So, I gave Night of the Living Dead, 1990, a remake of the 1968 version movie, uh, 3 out of 5. <laughs> James gave it a 2.5 out of 5. Ryan gave it a 2.5 out of 5. Can't believe I gave it a higher rating. I know. <laughs> Next week is the remakes, uh, reboot, continuation, whatever it is of the X-Files oh. TV show. And made. And the, the movie made, 2001. And as always, thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.